Good evening and welcome. Myself, Dr. Shavik Chaudhary, Medical Service Manager, Lupin Limited. I think all of you are aware that International Men's Day is on 19th of November 2021. And for that, we are celebrating this International Men's Week. And for this, we have organized a patient-centric series of web talk. So today is the third day. And today, we'll, di we'll discuss on sexual link health with men's health. So before starting the discussion, let us welcome our eminent speaker. Today, our eminent speaker is Dr. Sanjay Pandey. Dr. Sanjay is working as head andrology and reconstructive urology at Kokila Ben Dhirubhai Ambani Hospital in Mumbai. I welcome you, sir, in this expert web talk, and I am sharing the dice with you with a fruitful discussion. So my first question today uh, from the audience is, what kind of changes men can expect as the age advances or after andropause? Dr. Shobik, good evening. Uh, welcome to day three of uh, a very vastly uh, planned, attempted uh, movement on International Men's Health Day, which we are converting to uh, attempt to reach our colleagues over a week. The question about what changes do we uh, look at as men age gracefully at and beyond andropause is all about organ changes, is all about mental and physical changes. Let's look into that in a very short detail. In one way, you, you are at the prime of your life. That means you are so-called andropause, which is a late onset hypogonadism or the age group when your hormones are undergoing a change. Hormones undergoing a change, you can look at your counterparts, women who undergo menopause. So the body, which has actually been peaking together in all aspects, gradually goes down. In men's health, andropause or a late onset hypogonadism or a male menopause is related to the hormone called testosterone. As a result of the testosterone going down, there are umpteen changes happen around which happens both in the mind and body. Let's look at one. Men would look at uh, their early morning erections gradually going down. They may not find the erections as capable enough in the bed. They would look at their organ getting shorter and sh shrunk. The testicular function also goes down where the testis also feels shrunken. They look less confident overall because the hormone levels have gone down. So both in mind and body, the testosterone happens to be a kind of a magic potion. It being there on the first 45 to 50 years of your life, you feel very confident overall. Your muscle mass may gradually go down in andropause. That means as age changes from 40s to 50s and beyond, while you are at your plateau and peak and then you're gradually going down, 50 plus, the muscle mass may, may weaken up. There's a possibility that you feel a little grumpy and more drowsy and more sleepy. Your entire energy-wise, you feel less. For example, if somebody comes in late 50s, 60s and say, I feel low on the energy, both mental and physical. And you know that he is of that age group where other history suggests that he has a poor early morning erection, which is a marker of andropause or male menopause. He is sexually on the lesser side. He probably is very grumpy. He is not capable. And you look at that. There are multiple changes happening in him. So to cut it short and give you an idea that men who age gracefully in their 50s, 60s will have hormone going down. The term that you labeled andropause, a very loose term, which medically we call as a late onset hypogonadism. The hormone going away brings about changes on every aspect, which includes the brain, the muscles, the bones. Uh, you can develop easy fractures. You can have your muscle mass weak. You will feel low on your energy. You will feel low on your sexual drive. The capability to perform also gradually could go down. So one hormone, which is the bandmaster of the entire orchestra of male, gradually going down, brings about a lot of changes around. And those changes are sometimes very gradual and not surmise around. And therefore, when men come in that age group, which is 50s and beyond, and we look at their morale, their capability, their physique, and their entire sexuality going down. Then we know, look at the general health and the sexual health going down. We look at all those organ changes and capabilities going down. So this is common when the hormone goes away. And therefore, if somebody complains of that kind of stuff, as a urologist, as an andrologist, we focus ourselves into identifying, identifying and, treating, and treating. Thank you, sir. Thank you uh, for this excellent explanation. So we are just uh, going to the next question, sir. Can a husband and wife transmit urinary tract infection to each other or it can sexually transmitted disease be acquired from the toilet seat? So we're looking at health and if we're looking at safeguarding our health while in sexuality, nothing should go wrong. That's what 
today's larger topic is. That means, as an individual, as a male, and as a couple, nothing should go wrong. So, two important questions that you have put in, Dr. Shovik, which is an audience question. The first one is, can urinary tract infection be transmitted? So, that's not true. The transmission of urinary tract infection doesn't happen. If I have a UTI, I may not transmit it to a partner. In other words, it's not about urine being transmitted. What gets transmitted across are the secretions and discharges and the kind of aspects where the uh, the, the semen gets discharged into the vagina is one. And the vaginal fluid can get bathing the male organ and can possibly transmit those kind of bacteria which are not a part of the normal flora. For example, the vaginal bacteria is not a part of the normal male flora. And therefore, there's a high possibility that that aspect can be transmitted to a male. So, what can be transmitted is sexually transmitted infections. But remember, post a sexual activity, a woman can develop a urinary tract infection because the urinary passage of men and women are different. Remember, the entire sexual and urinary passage made is completely different. Just to give you a quick explanation, the urinary and sexual passage of men goes through the penis and the rectum is far away. But in women, the urinary passage in terms of the urinary bladder and the urethra is one. Behind that is the vagina and behind that is the rectum. So post-vaginal activity in terms of sexual activity, a woman needs to maintain a great hygiene, needs to clean up the whole area very well, lest she may land up with a urinary tract infection in a friendly neighborhood, which is the urinary passage. Bacteria are there in the vagina and in the rectum in a woman. And these bacteria do come into the endroitus and probably soil the endroitus. The demand for hygiene, therefore, is more in women than in men because the opening of the urinary passage is always contaminated by the vaginal and the rectal bacteria. So there's a possibility the woman can infect herself rather than looking at a toilet seat. That means a urinary tract infection can happen to a woman, not just because the toilet seat is uh, dirty or the toilet is dirty. No bacteria is waiting in a toilet to jump into a woman's urinary passage or the vagina just because she sat into a toilet. The toilet seat may be dirty and all that, but the bacteria are already sitting very close to the urinary passage because the vaginal bacteria and the rectal bacteria, which are foreign to the urinary passage, where there's no bacteria can easily cause infection. So, the transmission of urinary infection can happen in a woman from her own genital area, which is actually contaminated. And therefore, all women in the world need to maintain a great hygiene. A hygiene right. which is demanded of your body because God probably made the organs a little different in women compared to men. That's the bottom line, number one. And therefore, there are religions where because they have to do prayers five times a day, they maintain a hygiene to a much higher level compared to the hygiene that could be maintained by other religions. So, religion has a great science. Let's look into that. Number two. Uh, sexually transmitted infection is all about the transmission of bacteria or transmission of organisms, which are virus and fungi and micro microorganisms, which can happen during a sexual transmitted course of activity. And therefore, barrier contraceptives work very well. Irrespective of that, the male can be preserved. The woman needs to maintain a great hygiene post sexual activity by washing the introitus and the lower area, by passing urine and emptying her bladder before she goes to sleep that night. These are very important aspects. So, sexually transmitted infection is about transmission of the bacteria, fungus, etc. Urinary infection is not transmitted as a result of sexual activity. Mm -hmm. so, thank you, sir. Thank you for explaining in a simple way. Uh, so, we are moving to the next question. Why is the control of diabetes so important in erectile function? And your message to all the diabetes. That's important. Now, when we look at all these important dates, remember you have got an... Uh, a diabetes day every day world diabetes day which was last sunday and we need to look into how to prevent a issue of diabetes on various organ systems but diabetes is a metabolic disease a disease which affects uh, multiple organ systems what you pick up is the blood level and identify yourself as a diabetic looking at controlling the sugar levels which is actually the barometer of your entire control and health but as a diabetic individual youngsters who are very young and diabetics who are uncontrolled and very young diabetics insulin dependent diabetic mellitus they actually develop two kinds of issues in the penile organ one is called a diabetic microangiopathy one is called a diabetic neuropathy that means the nerves get affected and the vessels get affected we were talking recently on day one of this important program that the erectile function stands on the tripod of good vascularity good nerve issues and good hormone issues so if your uh, nerve issues are going wrong directly in the male organ if your blood supply issues have gone wrong directly in the male organ, you possibly will not have an erectile function which is commensurate with your age or commensurate with the capability that you would have compared to the counterparts at that age group who have no diabetes. So, all diabetic individuals run a risk of if being uncontrolled or long-standing. 
running a possibility of sexual dysfunction in terms of losing an erectile capability good enough for them to maintain. Not only that, my message to diabetics is if you don't control diabetics and diabetics is long standing, then possibly apart from what you develop here, you also develop a diabetic retinopathy, you develop a diabetic nephropathy, a kidney disease, develop a diabetic cystopathy where your bladder weakens up and the sensations go down and the urinary emptying becomes low. So message to all diabetics is diabetic, diabetes is not a one day disease. Sadly, it's a metabolic disease affecting multiple organ systems. To control diabetes, to bring about that lifestyle change in a lifestyle disease is an important aspect all the time. And all diabetologists, all hormone therapists look into this, that your diabetes stays under very strict control, which means obviously on one side diet, the other side the lifestyle, the exercises, yoga and all that you can do for yourself. And all people who watch this today in their 40s, 50s and 60s, and if anybody is a diabetic in the, as an audience or a diabetic in your family, the control of diabetes is, is, is paramount. It is important that we look into that. Not having done that, we may land up in a catastrophe in due course of time. So for men, the sexual dysfunction is massive in terms of developing erectile dysfunction, which is almost not reversible. Most of our diabetics do not respond to medical therapy, which we give to other individuals where they would require therapy by a penile processes because erectile mechanism is completely disturbed as a result of diabetic microangiopathy or diabetic neuro. Right, sir. Thank you for explaining in a simple way. Uh, so, we are moving to the next question. Uh, what does a normal semen look like and when should a person worry? A good question, Dr. Shavika. This is more for our general population to look at. A normal semen production is anything between 1.5 to 2.5 ml that you can ejaculate in one go. Some people could ejaculate even 5 ml. Some could ejaculate only less than 1 ml. So when you have two less than ejaculate, you should get worried because is there an obstruction to the to the, to the ejaculatory mechanism. The ejaculate is actually produced by various fluid mechanisms in the pathway towards ejaculation starting from the testis. It produces the spermatozoa which is then stored by transmitting through the vast difference into the seminal vesicles which are various kinds of small bags just behind your prostate. They store them and when you have this ejaculatory mechanism, the emission happens passively into the tract of the urinary passage through the ejaculatory ducts and that's from where you actively ejaculate through the urethra to the female organ to the exterior depending on the kind of sexual activity you are involved in. so this entire aspect of semen being a fluid which normally gets liquefied by seminogelin by a kind of a protein which is produced from the prostate which actually would liquefy the whole semen and the semen would become more watery is something where a lot of people get worried about if you have a very watery semen if you have a very thick semen you get worried about so remember it is all about a liquefaction process where semen liquefies in due course of time. You should not worry about semen as a as a as a physical evaluation. Physically, the semen is a little bit of fishy odor. It is only that amount which could anything be in 1.5 to 5 ml. A lot of people produce a lesser amount and then will get anxious and worried about. Not to worry, please. A lot of people can have bleeding in semen, and that can be very spontaneous. So sometimes we see that that is called as hematospermia. If there's a bleeding in semen, you need to see your urologist or your andrologist who will look at the causes. The commonest cause normally is non-specific inflammation and few ejaculates, multiple ejaculates could settle it out. The cause is identified. Rarely it could be a tuberculosis or a cancer in the seminal vesicles and the prostate. And therefore, if somebody has got bleeding in the semen, need to worry about but not to panic. Go and see your urologist in your town and city and he will handle this by evaluation, by medical therapy and by watching it. He may do a semen culture, he may do an evaluation, he may do a transsexual ultrasound, etc., etc. So the sexual health is linked to a lot of our mind and body issues. A semen is a fluid or probably a transmitting agent which allows a spermatozo to be transmitted. If your volume is too less, you need to be looking at it. it's not obstructed. If you're bleeding, you should be aware of it. Other than that, I would not suggest anybody should be worried about semen as a parameter, as a physical amount to look at and get anxious about. It is something which I, in your formative or in your fertile years is produced. You look at it and probably feel good because it is timed with your orgasm. And if you have an orga orgasm in which you can see ejaculate you feel comfortable with. There can be variations of it and the variations are treatable by your urologist in your city completely. Yeah, thank you sir for the wonderful explanation. So we are moving to the next question. Why sometimes the sexual drive is lower than normal? So the sexual drive which in medical parlance is called as libido is again a function of a lot of factors. A factor about understanding, number one, though you have grown into that mature years where the male hormones have come in around, it brings about that sexuality and the feeling about it. The feeling towards the opposite gender 
and therefore you're capable of performing. The drive is best in the situation where your hormone is best. And when is your hormone at the highest level as a male? It is early in the morning. So early in the morning, early we look at the testosterone levels. That's when we measure our hormone levels. It is actually the, the best level at that point in time. So the highest level of hormones okay. is at that point in time. And that is what you need to look into. Are you are you are you able to hear me, Dr. Sovik? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. So the the sexual drive is related directly to the availability of the hormones. For example, somebody comes in his 20s, 30s and say, my libido is low. And we look at all the other aspects being fine. That means the partnership is fine. There's no stress. There's no work-related tension. There's no injury. There's no trauma. There's no nothing. Then why should right. your sexual drive or libido be low? So is your hormone low? And therefore, we look at the hormone called testosterone. Mm -hmm. Let's not actually keep hitting our testosterone all the time because testosterone, a male hormone, undergoes a variation in life. Also variation in very fertile years. But when somebody talks about low sexual drive, the first thing which looks at it is the man very stressed? Is the man into psychological issues? Is the man going through a trauma? Is the man going through a, a personality change? Is the man requiring a counseling and probably a confirmation? Is there something wrong in a partnership? All these are important in a sexual drive at a psychological or at a la larger aspect. On the hormone aspect, the hormone being low could bring about a low sexual drive. So it can happen to very young and even to very old people. Therefore, we need to look into the hormone as one aspect and the male capability going down. The sexual drive could be low. The drive could be low because your partnership is not fruitful. The drive could be low because your partner may not be uh, supportive. The drive could be low because you are under stress to perform when you are not able to perform. So there are many more factors of low sexual drive. But overall, it is an internal feeling. And that feeling is a lot governed by hormones. Therefore, if I look at somebody who is not able to perform well, and somebody has a low drive, I would directly look at that this possibly is looking at that this gentleman is having a hormone issue, is having an issue which is more related to the body and not the mind alone. So both yeah. mind and body could bring about decrease in sexual drive. Yes, right. Thank you very much, sir, for explaining. So uh, there is a next question. The circumcision, circumcision is recommended for everyone or you recommend in some special cases? So circumcision or treatment of phimosis, where the extra redundant skin of the penis needs to be removed, which yes. is done religiously in all Jews and all Muslims, but is not practiced by other communities. So there is one way of doing a religious circumcision where we remove that extra amount of skin and it probably amounts to a good amount of hygiene and decreases the irritation to the tip of the sensitive organ called the penis. Number one. Number two, the aspect of looking at individuals who are having a tight skin. Uh, they wake up to their maturity in their adulthood in the late 15s, 20s and 30s where they find that the skin cannot be pliable or cannot move freely along the tip of the organ which does not give them the sexual pleasure. If that is so, Many people during their premarital and the marital years or just about to get married come and consult and look forward to a recovery on that aspect. And therefore, circumcision is warranted for people who have got a tight phimosis, a phimosis which does not let them perform a sexual activity, does not let them maintain a hygiene. For children who are born with a very tight skin and the skin is causing a ballooning of prepuce where a mother sees that the child when passing urine strains and the prepuce or the outer skin balloons around, we normally remove that. Children who are getting recurrent urinary tract infection in their three to seven years of life or getting a lot of infection and the infection is fever, febrile, and they're all male children. We normally do a circumcision as one of the very common phenomena because bacteria are harbored out there which are transmitted internally. So childhood circumcision is one. When they're becoming adults and adolescents and the skin is too tight and they cannot maintain a hygiene and cannot perform sexually and they are getting to understand their body image it's important to make them understand that the skin should be pliable as you grow into mature maturity and adulthood and the skin is not pliable and not mobile during your normal flaccid penis and during your erect penis then the best way is to probably get a medical help do a kind of a cosmetic circumcision as as urologists and endologists we do at the cochlear hospital for patients we clear the extra amount of skin and leave a lot of sensitive skin for them to perform we also end up doing circumcision for patients who develop acute and chronic bilanopositis where the skin gradually tightens up. And that's where I have a message for diabetics where the skin can gradually tighten up and tighten up to such levels so where you will have to remove it. That can happen at adulthood. It can happen even at geriatric age group where the diabetes was not under control and the skin had to be removed because this was completely tight and choked and getting a recurrent urinary tract infection because of that. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you for explaining this. 
uh, I got a question. Maybe some of our doctor friend has asked. There is a patient scenario. A patient claims that both his testicles are not in the same level. One of the testicles is higher than the other. So the patient concern is whether he will face any problem after marriage because of this condition. So, so we can one so single can sentence, no, no. There will be no problem. Okay. Uh, our left and right hands are different. Our left and right foot are also different. Right. So right. Uh, both of them don't have the same size. Both of them don't have the same level. And not to worry. Scrotum is a bag where the two testes have come down. Be happy with it. God gave you something we should not be happy, unhappy about. There are many people whose testes are inside the abdomen. You can find only one testis hanging around. And that's a sad story. The other testis will be lying inside the abdomen because both the testis move from the abdomen and go down right. into the scrotum on the day of the birth. So very important for us to have the two testis inside the scrotum fixed enough so they don't undergo a torsion or twist, which is important. To make you understand that this kind of an issue where we psychologically get worried, one testis is small, one is big, one is down, one is up, is only playing in the mind of a modern patient. Let's not look into that. Let's not uh, make our audience feel that one test is low and one test is up. It's part of life. One will be low, one will be alive. Normally, one is low, right? One is normally on a, on a lower side than left, but one is smaller, one is bigger. Let's not go into that because that's more of an anatomical phenomenon. An anatomy of two things may not be strange. I don't think we should worry about it at all. We should be worried if both the scrotum does not have testes. If the scrotum back, both the testes are not there and you're sitting on it, it's too late. We go to identify, do a sonography, MRI, and bring the testes sitting inside the abdomen down, which is very important for us. Yeah, thank you. So thank you for answering this scenario in a simple way. So uh, we got another scenario from a doctor, an overweight and diabetic patient, patient with normal serum count in his sperm analysis complains that he does not get erections easily and little semen is ejaculated during his uh, uh, play. So if, if, it, if could, you Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, sir, anything? Should, should I repeat the no. question? No, I've got it. So okay. if I understand the question right, the question is about yeah. an obese individual, obese individual where the metabolic syndrome is such that he is, ah. he is in a situation where the penis may also be buried. He is a ah. diabetic and therefore his erection may be on the lower ah. side. Yes. And little semen is ejaculated. So he, he so, wishes to plan a baby. What to advise? So I've got it. I've completely got it. Ah. I've got it. Yeah. So ah. one is he's obese. And obese ah. people, if they're all fat in the pre-pubic area, many times the penis actually gets buried which is another kind of a work that I need to look into. Hmm. Buried penis, cannot perform sexually, cannot handle the organ well. Sometimes they leak urine because the organ could not be handled as a result of a lot of fat in the pubic area. Now, they are diabetics also. If they are diabetics, then their sexual function itself is on the lower side. So once one way, the sexuality is poor. On the other way, you have got issues where you are very obese and cannot perform. So there are a lot of things happening in your life. If that is what it is and you want to plan a baby, you, your reptile mechanism is poor and you want to do a a cement test, then their ejaculation may not be very easy around. Such people need to be looking at partner participation, doing many a times a cement test in the privacy of their homes and collecting it properly because the proper collection is very important. So a proper collection of cement can only happen when you're comfortable, not possibly in the busy hospital where somebody could knock, not possibly because you are one who is obese and who is diabetic and his erectile mechanism is poor. The entire mechanism in the pubic area is poor and that kind of a scenario is not uncommon. So taking Taking care of your life, not increasing your body weight too much, not having too much of abdominal, abdominal and prepubic fat, diabetes being under good control, maintaining any erections, capable of being able to ejaculate both during sexual activity and during masturbation are the bottom line for this question. He anyway will get a semen out. He will use a partner. He will use himself. He will be masturbating and getting a semen out. He may take some medicines from our side, get erections around. But at the end of it, there are so many morbidities that he has. On one side, he's a diabetic. Other side, he's obese. Third is he is at this point in time in infertility, already married and therefore is not having children and therefore needs to get a semen report. That kind of morbidity should not touch our men in the International Men's Health Day, which we are celebrating to get people stronger and better. So if anybody is having these kind of trouble, they should see the urologist, andologist and these kind of patients. I continue to see morning till evening, almost every week, people come in from Monday to Saturday and see us for their various urinary and sexual issues, which happen to that class of men who are young, Unfortunately, primary infertile, obese, sexual dysfunction and the diabetes uncontrolled, which has already worsened the, the, the entire dysfunction scenario. Okay. Thank you, sir, for your valuable advice. So the next question is, most of the men's health issues need long-term treatment or any maintenance therapy. 
So yeah. we need a valuable advice to give to the patients to adhere to the treatment. True. So remember, uh, yeah. it is not about having fever that you take a medicine and get well. It's not true. Right. You are actually going through an issue where yeah. there was something happening. You missed it out. You attempted some therapies and now you're seeing a specialist called a urologist, andrologist, who's deeply interested in sorting you out, getting you back from the edge to a location which is much more safer. While we're attempting that, we need to look at there are therapies which are instantaneous, there are therapies which are injectable, there are therapies which are medical, and there are behavioral therapies. While there's a lot of counseling happens in sexual dysfunction, a lot of behavioral therapies are brought about, a lot of partner activities and partner participations are brought about. We need to probably polish and get better and better. And one of the attempts that we normally do is to look at medical management. So there are a lot of medical management for hormone issues, a lot of medical management for erectile issues, a lot of medical management for prenatal ejaculation. So these medical issues are all conglomerate, which actually help us to get our erectile function back into the main road to be capable enough. And you taking medications, feeling good, and then stopping the medication does not work. Your urologist in your city looks at improving you and therefore inducing you on therapies of the requirements that you aim and request for. As those therapies happen around, there's also parallel therapy where we want to improve and get it sorted. That getting sorted is such an important aspect. We need to improve it to levels from where you get to you a level to of maintenance. Now, when there's a maintenance, we de-escalate the dosages and bring the dosage to lower levels. Around. So the kind of tricks I'm trying to tell you is we want to see you do well. Once you do well, you'll continue to do well. But maybe you may not be performing sexually every day. As a result of which, we will look at how to stabilize you and look at using a medicine, either SOS or using a smaller dose on more of a regular or a weekly basis. And therefore, your doctor decides the kind of therapy he wants to give you. So the pillars of these, these therapies are medicines, sometimes which may be on a longer requirement. And therefore, you don't stop your medications around so early that you possibly will go back to the level where you were. In other words, my request to all those patients and all those individuals who would require various medical therapies for very, very reasons, diabetes, hypertension, sexual dysfunction, overactive bladder, incontinence of urine, so many things that we treat. And if you have got issues where you've recovered completely, a doctor decides how to escalate or de-escalate medicines and finally you recover. So kindly you don't stop medicines on your own. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay. San Dr. Sanjay, some of our audience wants explanations in Hindi, actually. Yeah. <laughs> we got uh, this thing. I would be so, keen to talk in Hindi. So uh, please uh, ask uh, questions. Very good, sir. Uh, sir, next question is, is vasectomy a safe procedure and can it be reversed? बिल्कुल बहुत अच्छा क्वेश्चन सो वैसेक्टोमी वो है जिसे मेल स्टेरिलाइजेशन कहते हैं जो एक इररिवर्सिबल सर्जरी होती है मैं खुश हूं कि इंटरनेशनल मेंस डे में पुरुष तैयार हो रहे हैं वैसेक्टोमी के बारे में बात करने के लिए अदरवाइज सैडली इस देश में दुनिया में औरतों को ही ओफरेक्टोमी करना पड़ता है उन्हीं को स्टेरिलाइजेशन या बर्थ कंट्रोल की सर्जरी करनी पड़ती है जो पुरुषों में बहुत ही आसान तरीका है वैसेक्टोमी वो है जहां हम स्क्रोटम में एक इंसीजन छोटी सी इंसीजन या नो इंसीजन नो स्कैल्पल टेक्निक के द्वारा ये वैसेक्टोमी करते हैं वैसेक्टोमी बहुत ही सेफ होती है वैसेक्टोमी उस जमाने से चली आ रही जहां हम एक मेल स्टेरिलाइजेशन या एक इररिवर्सिबल टेक्निक कर रहे हैं तो याद रखिएगा दंपति को ये जानने की जरूरत होती है कि अगर हम वैसेक्टोमी कर रहे हैं तो हमारी फैमिली कंप्लीट हो चुकी है हमारी फैमिली कंप्लीट होने के बाद हम वैसेक्टोमी कराते हैं जिसमें दोनों वास को हम इंटरप्ट करते हैं दोनों वास को हम ब्लॉक करते हैं ताकि हम जब सेक्सुअली परफॉर्म करते हैं तो हमें बेरियर कॉन्ट्रासेप्टिव्स और कॉन्ट्रासेप्शन की जरूरत ना पड़े हमारी फैमिली कंप्लीट हो चुकी है और हम सेक्सुअलिटी में अपने आप को कैपेबल पाए तो वैसेक्टोमी एक सेफ प्रोसीजर है वैसेक्टोमी पुरुषों की रिवर्सिबल प्रोसीजर है दोनों तरफ की वास या वो ट्यूब जो आपकी सेमन टेस्टिस और एपिडामिस की एरिया से सेमिनल वेसाइकल्स तक ले जाती है उसे हम इंटरप्ट करते हैं तो इस तरह से आपकी प्रोडक्शन घटती नहीं है प्रोडक्शन होती रहती है लेकिन आपकी वो जो पूरी चीज है वो फिर इजैकुलेशन के द्वारा नहीं आती ये आपके डॉक्टर आपको समझाते हैं कि ये बहुत ही सेफ प्रोसीजर है बहुत बार ये डे केयर में या एक रात की स्टे में की जाती है आजकल नो स्कैल्पल टेक्निक के द्वारा हम होल से इसे निकाल लेते हैं उसको इंटरप्ट करते हैं और फिर उतनी इजैकुलेट देखते हैं इसके बाद इसकी प्रोडक्शन ना होने पाए ओके तो लिंग परिवर्तन की जो सर्जरी होती है जिसे हम फैलो करते हैं फैलोप्लास्टी वो सर्जरी होती है जिसमें हम लिंग की परिवर्तन कर सकते हैं ये कित लोगों के लिए की जाती है पहला जो बच्चे हैं जो ग्रो कर चुके एडोलेसेंस और एडल्ट हो चुके पर उनकी पेनिस को माइक्रो पेनिस कहते हैं वो लेस देन 2.5 सेंटीमीटर की है या 2.5 या उस परसेंटाइल में है जिसमें हम हम सेक्शुअली केपेबल नहीं होंगे हमारी ऑर्गन डेवलप नहीं हुई अगर ऐसा होता है 
तो हमने कल रात को एक लिंग परिवर्तन किया उनमें जो तेईस चौबीस साल के हैं जिनकी बचपन में कुछ पेनाइल सर्जरी हुई थी लेकिन पेनिस ग्रो नहीं कर पाई उनके टेस्टिस नॉर्मल है पर उनके मेल ऑर्गन नहीं है अब तेईस चौबीस साल के हैं सेक्सुअली परफॉर्म करना चाहते हैं एक दंपति जीवन में अपने पार्टनरशिप में जाना चाहते हैं लेकिन लिंग की साइज नहीं बढ़ सकती बिकॉज वो लिंग बिल्कुल छोटी सी है तो ऐसे कंडीशन में हम वो सर्जरी करते हैं जिसे फैलो प्लास्टिक कहते हैं फैलो प्लास्टिक नॉर्मली मैं जेंडर ही असाइनमेंट में करता हूँ जिसमें हम हम फीमेल टू मेल सर्जरीज करते हैं लेकिन पुरुषों में हम फैलो प्लास्टिक कब करते हैं तो पुरुषों में जिनकी लिंक बहुत छोटी है जिनकी लिंक बड़ी नहीं हो रही है जिनकी लिंक उनके सेक्सुअल कैपेबिलिटी में दंपति जीवन में उनको हेल्प नहीं कर रही है वैसे कंडीशन में हम आज के जमाने में उस तरह की सर्जरीज करते हैं जहां हम पेनाइल ऑर्गन को ही बड़ा कर सकते हैं ये बहुत ही स्पेशलाइज सर्जरी होती है इसको लाइटली न लिया करें और ये सर्जरी आप डिसाइड नहीं करते अगर आपकी इच्छा भी होती है तो आपके यूरोलॉजिस्ट डिसाइड करते हैं ये सर्जरी बहुत हद तक भारत में हर कोई नहीं करता बिकॉज ये बहुत ही स्पेशलाइज तरह का काम होता है तो यहाँ पे हम उस तरह की सर्जरी करते हैं जिसमें हम उसी ऑर्गन को बड़ा करते हैं या फिर हम नई ऑर्गन बनाते हैं तो फैलोप्लास्टी मतलब प्लास्टिक रिपेयर विच इंक्लूड्स इंप्रूवमेंट ऑन द साइज ऑफ द पेनस और क्रिएटिंग ए न्यू पेनस ये एक तरह की रिकंस्ट्रक्टिव कॉम्प्लेक्स प्रोसीजर है जो हम बहुत बार करते हैं और लोग इंप्रूव होते हैं तो ये एक अलग तरह का ऑर्गन है जो हम बना रहे हैं या इसको इंप्रूव कर रहे हैं तो इसकी रिक्वायरमेंट और इसकी थेरापी बहुत ही अलग लेवल की इशू होती है और ये की जा सकती है ये की जाती है जब हम इसके बारे में सब पैरामीटर्स में सेटिस्फाई होते हैं तो आगे बढ़ के इसे ऑपरेट करते हैं जैसे हमने कल रात को किसी को किया थैंक यू सर थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर एक्सप्लेनेशन सर देयर आर फ्यू मोर क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम द ऑडियंस एंड वी आर रनिंग आउट ऑफ टाइम शुड वी कंटिन्यू प्लीज प्लीज गो अहेड ओके थैंक यू सो वन ऑफ आवर फ्रेंड हैज आस्क्ड इज फाइमोसिस नॉर्मल एट एज 25 सो फाइमोसिस और टाइट स्किन जो प्लायबल नहीं है could not be normal that's not the word but could be present at that age kyunki humne andekha kar diya parents soche ki ye skin abhi penis chhota hai bachcha chhota hai aur shayad ye skin jaise penis grow karega skin bhi grow karke lose ho jayega lekin jab hamari neend khuli aur hum 25 saal ke hain aur us samay hum paata chalta hai ki ye skin bahut tight hai jise hum phimosis keh rahe hain to ye normal kahan hai agar ye bahut tight skin hai to na aap urinary function maintain kar sakte na hi aap hygiene maintain kar sakte na hi aap sexuality maintain kar sakte ऐसे कंडीशन में फाइमोसिस की ट्रीटमेंट सरकमसीजन थैंक यू थैंक यू फॉर एक्सप्लेनिंग द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज डॉक्टर कैन थिक सीबन प्रोडक्शन इज गुड फॉर हेल्थ एंड हाउ आई कैन आइडेंटिफाई कम अगेन कम अगेन थिक सीबन डॉक्टर कैन थिक सीबन प्रोडक्शन इज गुड फॉर द हेल्थ एंड हाउ आई कैन आइडेंटिफाई डॉक्टर सोविक आई ऑलरेडी एक्सप्लेन दिस दैट थिक सीबन और थिन सीबन हैज गॉट लिटिल मीनिंग इट हैज गॉट नो मीनिंग so okay. thick or thin semen is because there is a agent which liquefies hamari semen thick reh sakti hai aur thin reh sakti hai ye thin aur thick ka jo pura dariya hai ye actually ek prostate se ek ek tar ki protein produce hoti hai jise semenogelin kehte hain wo is semen ko normally liquefy karti hai yaad rakhiyega normally bhi ejaculation ke 20 minutes mein semen ki liquefaction ho jani chahiye to ek liquid semen ek watery semen apne mein garbad semen nahi सेमेन एक तरह का व्हीकल है एक तरह की एक्टिविटी है जिसमें स्पर्माटोजोआ स्विम करके जाते हैं और इस तरह से एक व्हीकल जिसको ट्रांसमिट करती है तो थिक सेमेन और थिन सेमेन कहीं भी हेल्थ की कोई पैरामीटर नहीं होती ये बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट है आपको आइडेंटिफाई करने की कोई जरूरत नहीं है अगर थिन सेमेन है तो सेमेलो के ज्यादा प्रोड्यूस हो रही है थिक सेमेन है सेमेलो के कम प्रोड्यूस हो रही है थिक या सिंथ सेमेन जैसे इजैकुलेट होता है उसके बाद अगर थिक रह गया तो बेकार है फिर वो एक्टिविटी के नालायक नहीं रहता फिर वो एक पार्टनर को फिर वो कंसीव करने में मदद नहीं करता तो उसे लिक्विफाई होना पड़ता तो लिक्विफेक्शन के एजेंट्स होते हैं तो थिक और थिन समन के द्वारा ना जाएं, वो आपकी कंफ्यूजन और मेंटल स्टेट को तंग करती है वो आपका पैरामीटर नहीं थैंक यू थैंक यू डॉक्टर संजय सो ऑलमोस्ट ऑल द्वेश्चन रिगार्डिंग Early morning performance is good compared yeah, to late. Yeah, early morning performance is good compared so to. So you know why, Doctor Sawik? Early morning uh-huh. male performance is better than the late night performance. At late night, when you come back, you have a partner waiting, but you are personally, physically tired. You are also yes. mentally tired after long days of work. Number two, yeah. number that does not mean that you can't perform. But compared to a uh, early morning when you're fresh from sleep and you're fresh overall, your hormones also are at the highest level. So when your hormones uh-huh. are at the highest level, you actually are capable of managing yourself best. So to me, yeah. it is such an important as- aspect that we need to look into and help these patients out for making them understand that this is such an important aspect. Okay. So to me, it is extremely important for people to understand that the entire sexuality about satisfaction mm-hmm. of oneself and the partner a lot depends on the capabilities. 
therefore it is a partnership issue sexuality of an individual is a lot related to the kind of capability he individually has and then he partners his capability with the partner so when we look at penetration capability ejaculation masturbation all those things around we look at the mind and the body we look at the mental state of these patients around today we're looking at health link and sexual links and we understand that maintaining a great health is such an important issue your aspects of health which is about diabetes about blood pressure about lifestyle about the number of hours of sleep to have regeneration of your body and to get your body polished to return back early in the morning you sleep that number of hours your rhythm of the body is maintained your hormones are maintained very well your testosterone right. is maintained if this maintained your possibly your andropause who knows may get delayed i'm talking right. only theoretical in that situation it cannot happen so that you sleep well and drink well and your hormones will get better and better with passing time it doesn't happen but yes you regenerate and therefore male hormone is something which can only worsen with stress which can how which can worsen with various kinds of traumas which happen around so to, to be alive to be active to be hygienic to be able to be in a aura of a good uh, relationship is all that matters in sexuality and that is always linked to your health both mental and physical they define in who that health is the absence of any infirmity and any disease so to yes. decrease yes. your mental and physical dysfunction mm -hmm. is why you need to have a great partnership and in international men's health day that is the motto that we all have yeah thank you sir thank you since three days we are discussing about the sexual health of the uh, men so i think uh, we have covered almost all the aspects of the sexual health in this uh, very short time so what is your opinion dr sanjay anything i think i think the say? kind of uh, the kind of audience questions i saw today in the last uh, three you. days overall i'm uh -huh. enthused that you know the kind of platforms we create for our society where a lot of these uh, things are not discussed it's important for us to take audience questions i also mm -hmm. enthuse our audience who happen to be on the edge with problems in sexuality like the ones with the youngsters having erectile issues and the kind of myths they live in other mm -hmm. side they had a premature ejaculation which we discussed today and now the transmission issues and partners capability and the male hormones and the kind of issues we're looking at i would not look at just being sitting there and only listening to the program and missing it out at this important platform created from the ramparts of the kokila ben dhirubhai ambani hospital in partnership with lopin india to be able to reach all men on the international men's health day which we have decided to make it look at look as if it is a complete week that we are celebrating to make you aware don't keep sitting on awareness issues get into that awareness where we are looking at and kindly don't ignore your health issues you look at your overall health look at your diabetes look at your blood pressure look at your capability look at your mental health look at your partnership live in a good congenial relationship that is what men's health is all about we need to improve to such levels from where we only get better and better so the questions have been good i would only enthuse more and more people who have got trouble beyond this to go and see their doctors at kokilaben hospital that i see a lot of people coming from the various cities and including mumbai oh. we treat them and probably get them better i hope that these kind of programs help our people sitting on the edge and couples to make decisions to get treated and get and do better and better okay thank you very much thank you dr sanjay and we are concluding the session uh, it's a wonderful session actually since three days and today also and on behalf of lupin family especially thank you for making this discussion rich and making this day a success and today tomorrow we are coming up with one more discussion on men's health that is uh, one more discussion on men's health do not ignore urological issues so i request everyone to kindly tune in at the same time to have a fruitful discussion so tell we meet you tomorrow at 8:30 we're looking yeah. at men's health <coughs> and don't ignore urological issues I think it's a great competition. I look forward to wonderful questions from the audience. Dr. Shobhi, you could compile many of them which come through the across to you Definitely. and live audience which always ask questions. I salute mm -hmm. each of you in this audience for being a part of this wonderful campaign that we're bringing to you to probably break this menace of silence that you have. You are the right. only one who can be a game changer. So, as an audience, as an individual who's going through a trauma of sexual health and sexuality, can to continue to improve your men's health can do best only if you probably partner each other. and that's why the platform has been created thank you lupin thank you. india thank you dr shovik thank you very much thank well. you sir thank you good night